Once you've collected data and done analysis or whatever, a lot of times you need to present your data to other people. And one of the very best ways that you can present data in a meaningful way is by using a graph of some type. Now, um, in previous sections, we looked at a couple of types of graphs. We looked at histograms and we looked at box plots or box and whisker graphs. And these two are great ways that you can demonstrate data, but it's very specific. These <clears throat> types of graphs can only be used for quantitative data. And if you think about it, this should make sense because our bottom line in a histogram or a box plot is a, a number line. Um, or um, box plot, there we go. Right, and this doesn't have any meaning unless it has some sort of a number line associated with it. So it's all about this equally spaced continuous values where you can kind of see if there's breaks in the graph and you can get an idea of, um, <clears throat> of all of the individual, of all of the data points within groupings of, of things that are going on. So histograms and box plots, super ways that we can display um, and summarize quantitative data. Now, what can you do if you're dealing with qualitative or categorical data? Qualitative, wrong letter there. Uh, the two most common ways that we can display <clears throat> categorical data are bar graphs, and pie charts. Both of these give you a way to display anything that's going on. When we're dealing with bar graphs, a bar graph is going to is pretty similar to a histogram. In fact, a histogram is a special type of bar graph with that number line bottom. Uh, with a typical bar graph, you're going to put your different options down below. So let's say that you were asking for a favorite color, uh, maybe red, blue, and green were your different options. And then the height of your bar graph is going to be representing the frequency or the number of people that answered that particular result. So if maybe this is 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, if we have 10 people that responded red, we had 20 people that responded blue and five people that responded green, this would uh, be an illustration of our bar graph. We can figure out the total number of people that participated in the survey by adding the different heights. So if we added 10 and 20 and 5, we had 35, <clears throat> excuse me, 35 different uh, people that contributed to the survey. And then, for example, if I wanted to know how many of those people liked uh, green the best, there would be five out of those 35 people that preferred green, and then I can convert that fraction into a decimal by dividing those values. So five divided by 35 gives me 0.1428, or 1429 if we round, which is 14.29%. So this is an example of a bar graph. Uh, another type of bar graph that you'll see sometimes is called a relative frequency bar graph. Let's try another one here. Relative frequency. A relative frequency bar graph is going to be almost the same as a frequency bar graph, but the difference is instead of showing the count or the, in this case, the number of people in the survey, uh, it's going to show a percentage of your value. So if you're looking at a frequency bar graph, In this case, if we, we could even use those same values here, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. My green was 14.29%. My blue yeah, 20 divided by 35 is 0.5714 or 57.14%. And my red was 10 out of 35, which is 0.2857, or 
28.57%. And so these would be my values here. If these were now percentages, what I get is just a relative comparison where I can pictorially see the different heights of my graphs. Here you've got your 28%. We have our 57.14%, so up there somewhere, and my 28.57% down here. So this is going to be the difference between my relative frequency and the frequency is just the count that we have here with a standard bar graph. It's counting by numbers. With a relative frequency bar graph, it's counting by percentages. Here we can get a good view, very obviously, of which one there's the most of. Oh, hang on, 14.29. This was down farther here. And we can see the same kind of pattern that we have up here in terms of the height of our different of our different graphs. One thing with the relative frequency is we don't necessarily know how many people were surveyed or anything like that in this one, where here we could count up these totals to get uh, the total number of people that were contributing to the survey. With the relative frequency bar graph, if we were to add up all of these totals, what we would end up with is 100%. And you can double check that work here to see how that goes. If you ever have any time that you know 100% of the data values. The other type of graph that you can do is a pie chart. And a pie chart basically gives us, it's called a pie chart because we have, uh, it's based on a circle graph here. So we start with a circle and then we're going to divide the circle up into the proportions of what's going on here. So in this case, blue was a little bit more than 50%. So this was 57.14%. Uh, this was my blue section. Uh, red was about 14%. Or sorry, green was 14%. And red over here was at 28.57%. And so we can see this breakdown really nicely, and it gives us a nice visual look at what those percentages are. Uh, you can calculate these uh, by hand by figuring out how many degrees there are in a circle and all of that kind of thing, but technology does a great job. And you can find a variety of programs, even the graph sets in Microsoft Word or Excel. If you put your data points in, they can come up with a pie graph that has all of the angles exactly right so that they're proportional in terms of how they label. Uh, a pie chart, like a relative frequency chart, loses how many people participate. So if I didn't have that information, all I would know is just essentially the percentage of a population that felt a certain way. It's an easy way to identify which one was most and least and have a general idea of what's going on. However, if they told you that maybe this time we had these percentages, and if they told you that maybe there were a total of, now we'll make it easy, 100 people surveyed, Then I could go back and I could figure out each category. As long as I knew the total, I can use those percentages then. Uh, so 57.14% of 100 people, and I can multiply that percentage in decimal form by that, and I get 57.14 people. Out of the 100 people were uh, recording blue. And we'd have some rounding issues and stuff that we could deal with as far as that goes. Um, but as long as you know some sort of a total, you can use those percentages to figure out a specific value or amount. Uh, but otherwise, that pie chart loses those particular values. So these are the primary ones that, that you'll look and see when we're dealing with quantitative or qualitative, excuse me, categorical data um, is just basically being able to put all of those things out. If we have numbers or quantitative data, then uh, histograms and box plots provide a better look at uh, displays for your data.